This is PediaCast. Welcome to PediaCast, a pediatric podcast for parents. And now, direct from the campus of Nationwide Children's, here is your host, Dr. Mike. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to PediaCast. It is a pediatric podcast for moms and dads. This is Dr. Mike coming to you from Nationwide Children's Hospital. We're in Columbus, Ohio. It's episode 524 for September 6th, 2022. We're calling this one Iodine and Child Brain Development. I want to welcome all of you to the program. So we have a really important topic for you today as we raise awareness about the dangers of iodine deficiency, uh, especially in pregnant moms, babies, and children. And it's important because iodine deficiency is the leading preventable cause of intellectual disability in children. And when intellectual disability occurs because of iodine deficiency, the damage is irreversible. We also know that intellectual disability can impact quality of life and future success with education, jobs, and relationships. So there's a cost to iodine deficiency at the individual, family, and community levels, which means prevention of iodine deficiency is something we should all care about because we care about our friends and neighbors, and we want every child to have the best shot of thriving right out of the gate. Now, This is not to say that those with intellectual disabilities are not able to have a great quality of life and achieve success, but it certainly is more difficult, right? There are more challenges, more barriers, and of course, more cost to that success. And so we want to prevent intellectual disability when when we can, but we also want to 100% support those impacted by iodine deficiency and its effect on child brain development. Now, You may be wondering, uh, why is it that iodine is important for child brain development and how does it prevent intellectual disability? We're going to explore the science of these relationships and we'll also consider the scope of the problem. Uh, But I will give you a hint. Iodine deficiency is pretty common, even in developed countries like the United States. So uh, how does iodine deficiency occur? How is it treated? And better yet, what can we do to prevent it? And we'll have answers to all of these questions and more as we explore iodine and its impact on child brain development and intellectual disability. Of course, in our usual PediaCast fashion, we have three terrific guests joining us for the discussion. Dr. Liz Zamuda is a pediatrician and director of medical education at Doctors Hospital, which is part of the Ohio Health System here in Central Ohio. Dr. Elizabeth Pierce is an endocrinologist and professor of medicine at Boston University College of Medicine. And Marina Shapiro is a registered pediatric dietitian and founder of Nutri Chicos, which is a bilingual dietary practice for young patients and their families. They'll join us soon, but first, our usual quick reminders don't forget you can find PediaCast wherever podcasts are found. We're in the Apple and Google Podcast apps, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, Amazon Music, and most other podcast apps for iOS and Android. If you like what you hear, please remember to subscribe to our show so you don't miss an episode. Also, please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts so that others who come along looking for evidence-based child health and parenting information will know what to expect. We're also on social media. We love connecting with you there. You'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Simply search for PediaCast. And we have that handy contact page if you would like to suggest a topic for a future episode of the program. You can find that contact link over at pediacast.org. Also, I want to remind you the information presented in every episode of our podcast is for general educational purposes only. We do not diagnose medical conditions or formulate treatment plans for specific individuals. If you have a concern about your child's health, be sure to call your healthcare provider. Also, your use of this audio program is subject to the Pediacast Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at pediacast.org. So let's take a quick break. We'll get our expert guests connected to the studio, and then we will be back to talk about iodine and child brain development. It's coming up right after this. Uh 
Dr. Liz Zamuda is a pediatrician and director of medical education for Doctors Hospital, which is part of the Ohio Health System here in Central Ohio. Dr. Elizabeth Pierce is an endocrinologist and professor of medicine at Boston University School of Medicine. And Marina Shapiro is a registered pediatric dietitian and founder of NutriChicos, which is a bilingual dietary practice for young patients and their families. All three have a passion for raising awareness about the importance of iodine and its role in preventing intellectual disabilities in children. That's what they're here to talk about, iodine and child brain development. But first, let's give a warm PediaCast welcome to our guests, Dr. Liz, Dr. Elizabeth, and Marina. Uh, thank you all for stopping by today. It's so nice to be here. Thank you, Dr. Mike, for inviting us. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks. I'm excited for the conversation, too. Yeah, I'm really excited and so glad that the three of you were able to uh, take time out of your very busy schedules to join us and talk about um, iodine. I think a great place to start uh, with Dr. Pierce, what, what exactly is iodine? I think it's something you know, like a chemical. I think most people have heard of it before, uh, but give us some more uh, information about iodine. So iodine is a trace element. It's found naturally in seawater and in the Earth's crust in much of the world. But there are many regions of the world where there is, is really not enough iodide in the soil so that if foods are grown in those regions, the food products that are produced in those areas will be low in iodine. And therefore, humans who are eating those foods will also wind up being iodine deficient. So, so this is a chemical that um, we have to get outside of our body. It's not naturally inside, right? Correct. Correct. And so if we're not getting that in our diet or through some kind of supplementation, then we're going to have an iodine deficiency. And so as we think about uh, medicine, uh, what role does iodine play in the body? Uh, why is it important for us to, to get it? Well, it plays only one role in the body as far as we know, but it's actually quite an important role. So iodine is needed for the production of thyroid hormone. And thyroid hormone is needed in turn to regulate how the body uses energy. And in early life, it's particularly important for regulating growth and development. Yeah. Um, so we have iodine coming uh, as a trace element um, coming in through food products. And if we have enough of it, we can make enough thyroid hormone. And if we don't have enough iodine in our diet or through supplementation of some kind, um, then we're not going to be able to make enough thyroid hormone. And so then we would have a condition um, that we would call hypothyroidism. So less thyroid hormone than, than you, your body needs. Um, what are some of the the symptoms of hypothyroidism um, that so iron deficiency then could cause that through the means of not having enough thyroid hormone? Um, so iodine deficiency it causes hypothyroidism, you know, truly low thyroid hormone levels. Uh, only in regions of severe iodine deficiency. So that's going to be a manifestation you're not going to see in places where levels of iodine are, are intake are only mildly low. Hypothyroidism can manifest as fatigue and cold intolerance, constipation, kind of foggy thinking. People describe brain fog. Uh, irregular periods, infertility in women, so a whole host of symptoms. But the consequences of iodine deficiency are broader than that um, because iodine deficiency causes hypothyroidism really only as the tip of the iceberg, and there are lots of other manifestations. Yeah. So you have to have really um, low levels of, of thyroid hormone to have hypothyroidism and those symptoms that you had mentioned. Uh, but even if you have, um, you know, just a relative iodine deficiency, it's less than is ideal. And so you're still making some thyroid hormone, but perhaps not enough thyroid hormone uh, to cause other consequences. Right. It causes stress for the thyroid when there's not enough iodine to manufacture thyroid hormone. And that can cause enlargement of the thyroid or goiter or thyroid nodules, lumps within the thyroid. Uh, and we'll talk about this obviously quite a bit more, but critically important for brain development in very early life. And so even modest degrees of iodine deficiency can be associated with impairments of intellectual development in children. Yeah. So a mom with a baby inside, um, you know, may have enough iodine that, and enough thyroid hormone that she's not hypothyroid but it still could affect the baby in terms of their brain development. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And so Liz, I want to bring you into the conversation is um, uh, it would seem then the iodine is going to be really particularly important 
uh, during the prenatal period when the brain is first developing if the thyroid hormone is needed for proper brain development. Absolutely. So in addition to the fact that we know that there are women walking around that are iodine deficient, we know that the demand for iodine actually increases by up to 50% during pregnancy and lactation. So um, depending on where they start from, that can obviously have a different impact on, on different women and um, mom's the only source of iodine for that infant. And so initially before the baby has their own thyroid that's functioning, you know, they're reliant on the mom's thyroid hormones for for their well-being. But then sometime around mid-gestation, their own thyroid starts to work. And so then that iodine is also important for the development of their thyroid hormone. Yeah, that that makes sense. And so um, a lot of, as you mentioned, um, a lot of moms are sort of relatively iodine deficient to begin with going into pregnancy. And then you're not only providing iodine for yourself, you need it for the baby as well. And as you said, um, that need increases by uh, 50% or more during pregnancy. And yet a lot of women enter into pregnancy sort of deficient in iodine to begin with. So that's a problem. Exactly. I mean, we know that kids, their diet around middle school, probably even before that, is really representative of what they're going to be when they're entering those prenatal time periods. And so it's it's not just about catching them when they're thinking about becoming pregnant. It's really about that lifelong education and support for the proper nutrition for for children and and for women specifically in this case. Yeah. And we're going to talk more about this, but I just want to introduce this concept that um, if you you don't have enough iodine and enough thyroid hormone during those early months of development inside mom during that prenatal period, um, that can lead to irreversible um, what we'd call neurocognitive defects, um, which is really a lower IQ, lower ability to think or intellectual disabilities, right? Right. So iodine deficiency is the most preventable cause of intellectual disability in the world. And I think whatever I say that I have to sit for a minute because that is really astounding to me um, that the thyroid hormones are crucial for brain development in things like cell migration, differentiation, myelination of nerve fibers, all of these things that are happening at this really critical time point for brain development. It's such a period of rapid growth. And the interesting thing about the brain is that more complicated processes rely on the successful completion of the previous ones. And so it it builds upon itself and it's really important to get it right from the beginning. Um, and that's why you can see an impact on IQ and intellectual function later. Yeah, because um, it's just so important for brain development for that to be in place. And so we really want to combat iodine deficiency wherever we can. And as you said, not just targeting um, moms who may become pregnant, but really everyone, because you don't know when you're going to become pregnant. And it doesn't, you don't have to have such low iodine that there's hypothyroidism disease uh, to clue you in. It could really be anyone who feels fine and yet they're iodine deficient. And that could impact their child's brain development and their um, intellectual powers later in life. Absolutely. And and things, you know, this can be really complicated, but things like food insecurity can even play a role in that. And, and understanding access to appropriate nutrition and what that means for socioeconomic classes um, and ultimately the, the function and the IQ of that community. So it's really an important point for us to be focusing on as a medical profession. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what about uh, um, women who are breastfeeding? So, you know, um, I would suspect that that babies get some of their iodine through breast milk. And so it would be important not only during uh, pregnancy, but also after pregnancy Uh, in terms of the child's brain development, really making sure that lactating moms also um, are not iodine deficient, correct? From the from the standpoint of brain development, absolutely. But I, I am going to turn this one over to Dr. Pierce and ask her to answer some of the specifics about the excretion of iodine and, and how all of that looks in that postnatal time period. Yeah, so women who are breastfeeding actively secrete iodine into breast milk. It's concentrated in breast milk at levels 20 to 50 times higher than what's circulating in the blood. And that's important because for a breastfed infant, that mom's breast milk is going to be the only source of iodine nutrition. So women who have maintained sort of optimal iodine state all through pregnancy will continue to to have higher iodine requirements until they're done breastfeeding. 
that so really important to think about iodine. And since uh, the only way that we get it in is through what we are eating um, and or uh, supplementation, I wanted to bring uh, Marina, who is our dietitian on board here. Um, what are some good sources of iodine? What, what should we be eating in order to prevent iodine deficiency? And I think, Dr. Mike, you, you brought up an important point initially that we're like, okay, iodine, like what is iodine, right? And so I think I, I did this, you know, very non-randomized uh, poll in my Instagram and just really asking everyday moms, like, tell me about iodine. Like, what do you know about iodine? Were you ever told about iodine when you were pregnant? And I think most of them, and including myself when I was pregnant, we really have very little clue on iodine. Maybe we've seen it in salt and that's how, kind of how we associate it. But I think that's not the recommendation, right? I think we want to focus not just on using iodized salt, we can get a little into that, but really how can we optimize iodine through iodine-rich foods? And so that's where really dairy food, eggs, and fish come into play. Really, those are key sources of, of, of natural iodine. And I think, uh, I mean, the new dietary guidelines really emphasize that in particular, you know, women who do not consume dairy foods, eggs, seafood, or use iodized table salt are, are really at risk. And so I think there's I think there's various, you know, problems or risk. I think the fact that women, pregnant women and, and lactating women need more iodine. I think that the rise of, you know, vegan diets, plant-based diets, where they might be, be missing some of these key foods. And also we talked about kind of the rise of, of the non-iodized salts, right? You, you go to a neighbor's house and you ask them, what type of salt do you have? They might have pink salt, Himalayan salt, all these kind of fancier to a lot of people, maybe healthier type of salt where they're not actually providing the iodine that our body needs. And so I think it's a multifactorial uh, issue, but it's simply if we consume three sources of, da of dairy, you're going to get enough iodine. And what I like especially is that really it's 20 cents per serving of dairy. So it's really economical. It's really affordable. It's accessible. And so my whole concept is, you know, it doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to be complicated. It's really about meeting our moms and our patients where they are and just providing practical solutions that are going to work for pregnant women. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes, especially as we think about um, healthy eating, um, those foods that you mentioned, uh, milk, cheese, um, eggs, uh, get kind of a bad rap a little bit in terms of fat content. And so, you know, we hear over and over, we need to lower the saturated fat in our diet, maybe not so much for little kids, uh, but as we're thinking about pregnant moms, they may have heard the message that I need to really watch my fat intake. Um, how can we be smart about uh, getting dairy foods, cheese, milk, eggs in, but maybe not having all the added fat content? And I think what it comes down to is education, right? I think one of my biggest uh, challenges is really to uh, myth bust a lot of the, the messages that we hear that are really not evidence-based. And so, you know, when it comes to fat, you know, there's multiple, that's a good part about dairy, that there's many varieties, there's many ways of consuming it from a 2%, from a full fat, uh, from a 0% fat milk. And so same concept goes to lactose intolerance, right? I might deal with families that say, you know, they that they can't tolerate some type of milk. And so there are lactose-free options as well, which are the real deal. They're still going to provide the same iodine uh, amount uh, as regular milk. They just don't have the lactose. So I think a big part of my job is to kind of understand, okay, why is it that you're doing what you're doing, right? So it is my job, I always say, is not to be the food police. It is not to tell them this is what you need to do, but rather, okay, listen first. Okay, you're, you're worried about the fat content. Okay, let's talk. Let's find out other sources, other alternatives. Uh, and I think that's where the education comes into play, that there's numerous ways of getting iodine, whether it's through dairy, through eggs, through fish, um, it's just finding ways that fit them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like you mentioned, um, you can definitely choose a lower fat milk, whether that's 2% or skim milk, and that's still going to have the same amount of iodine in it, correct? 
Absolutely. And I, I will point out that, unfortunately, a lot of the plant-based or soy uh, milks do not provide iodine uh, compared to, you know, the dairy. And so that's, that's a really key factor when we're dealing with vegan moms or vegetarian moms that are not consuming dairy products. It's, again, first understanding why are you doing what you're doing or respecting that, but providing them the appropriate support and appropriate resources to say, you know, this is really something that you are missing. How can we find other alternatives so you're not at risk or your baby is not at risk or, you know, you name it. Yeah. And I, I want to underscore again that um, we're only talking about cow's milk, right? So if you are talking soy milks, almond milks, oat milks, there's a lot of them out there now. Um, those are not going to have good iodine content compared to cow's milk. Exactly. So I believe one cup of um, cow's milk provides about maybe 70, I think it's 88 uh, micrograms of iodine versus the other ones provide less than one. So it's really a huge comparison. Eggs are a great uh, source. How many eggs would you need to eat a day to get good iodine in? So at the iodine's in the egg yolk, and you would need to eat a fair number of eggs to get your iodine only from eggs. It's maybe about 30 micrograms per egg yolk. Okay. So that may not be a practical way. Eggs only is off the table. <laughs> but we know, for example, that cod, so three ounces of cod actually provides one of the highest amounts of iodine with 158 uh, milligrams of iodine. Uh, so that's a really good source of iodine as well. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't mention fish yet. Mm -hmm. And I think this is another one where you really have to take the person into consideration, right? Because pregnant women are also hearing that you want to stay away from too much mercury. And so there are certain fishes that, you know, like tuna, for example, can have high um, uh, mercury content. Uh, what about cod? Is that safe from a mercury standpoint? That's a lower. Uh, that's a lower mercury fish. So we know that even, for example, a canned tuna. Uh, to some people, might think you know all type of canned tuna might have the same amount of mercury, but actually no. Albacore tuna and white tuna that is canned are different. Uh, white canned tuna tends to have a lower mercury amount than, let's say, an albacore, but they're both considered medium. And so I think, again, just, you know, when looking at my, when, when counseling my pregnant women, there's so many things to consider, you know, where, whether it's food safety, whether it's, you know, exercise, whether it's the mercury, whether it's the iodine, whether it's the, uh, so I think it's just a matter of making it simple and making it, you know, real. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Th this is why every medical practice needs a dietitian in the office to help their patients. I mean, because we don't know this stuff, right, Liz? Liz well, you do, Elizabeth, because, you know, you're an iodine <laughs> expert. But um, for us normal pediatricians, we don't learn a lot about this stuff, right, Liz? Right. That's, that's actually what I was going to comment on is, um, you know, we don't have to be experts. We need to understand the importance and we need to understand, generally speaking, what are the foods. And I think if we are able to counsel our patients and our families from the standpoint of really focusing on variety, I mean, obviously we're not just gonna eat eggs all day long to get our iodine, but if we have some dairy and some eggs and some fish and it's incorporated into the diet on a, on a regular basis, probably things are gonna work out just fine. And I think that's where I come from when I'm counseling patients is just really flexibility, variety, understanding the importance. And then when you understand the importance, it drives the decision. And if we are uncertain, somebody's high risk or um, food insecure or unable to have those foods for whatever reason, either choice or allergy, that's when it's really important to engage in the dietitian because it's going to become a little bit more complicated. So I, I agree. It's, it's hard to know everything and the recommendations for physicians change all the time. So their best bet is to really partner with a dietitian. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the key take home here is going to be uh, dairy food, um, cow's milk, cheeses, yogurts. We didn't mention yogurts, but those are an excellent source as well with less lactose, right? Than cow's milk. Correct. And then uh, eggs we mentioned and uh, seafood. And in particular, cod is a really good one uh, if you're looking for a lot of iodine. And I would add to that list, really importantly, don't add extra salt to the diet. But if you're going to be using salt in cooking uh, or at the table, make sure it's iodized salt. That's an easy thing to do. Yeah, And it should be clearly on the label. If you don't find it saying iodized or iodine, 
on the label, you should assume it does not have iodine in it. That's correct. correct. Now, a lot of a lot of uh, processed foods, um, soups, for example, you know, you look at the sodium content and uh, they're quite high in salt. Uh, but that's not necessarily iodized salt either, correct? Yeah, unfortunately, salt iodization has never been mandated in the United States. It's always been voluntary. And by and large, the food processors in the United States are not using iodized salt in their products. So even though the vast majority of sodium that we ingest in America is coming from commercially processed foods, that's unfortunately not necessarily going to be a good source of iodine. Um, I wonder if like, if there was a mandate and all of that salt was iodized, could you get too much iodine? Can you have iodine toxicity? Um, only if we are not doing a good job as a public health nutrition community, um, that we monitor the salt uh, co concentration of iodine, we regulate that, uh, and we monitor the population iodine status. So it's perfectly possible, for example, as countries work to reduce sodium intakes to improve cardiovascular outcomes, to just alter the amount of iodine in salt to keep things stable as, as sodium intakes shift. Gotcha. So in other words, um, you may have to go down a little on, I on how much iodine it goes into the iodized salt or up a little depending on the that community. Exactly health. right. But it's actually fairly straightforward to adjust. Good to, good to know. Just people have to talk. The industries have to talk together, right? Well, that's always the problem. <laughs> but there are lots of efforts ongoing yeah, yeah, around the world to harmonize these, these decisions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what about multivitamins? Um, you know, this is a iodine is a trace element. Um, other elements like calcium, for example, are present in multivitamins and we have prenatal vitamins that uh, moms can take. Uh, is there iodine present in those vitamins or is that something that you have to also look for on the label? So I think this is this is something really important for moms and practitioners because I think they get all sorts of recommendations. Uh, some of them might not even contain DHA. So it's I think it's really important, again, that education piece because about, you know, half of the the prenatal supplements do not contain iodine, uh, and so this is this is something to note that when you are looking for a, a multivitamin, to know. And and so when I went to my pharmacy, I started looking right, and so it's fairly easy. You will just find iodine, and so those simple education pieces are going to be really important because you know they might not be containing it. Um, and, and again, it's it's not just important when they are pregnant, but rather, you know, the three months prior or that prenatal, that planning phase, that's where it's really going to be important for them to know, am I taking the right supplement? Yeah, yeah, really, really good point. I might also just make a couple points that I think are, are, are helpful here. Uh, one is that for whatever reason, the prenatal multivitamins that are marketed in the U.S. that are sold by prescription only rather than over-the-counter are actually much less likely to contain iodine than the over-the-counter ones. And you can't look at the label and know what's in there. So the recommendation by and large is, is for looking for those over-the-counter supplements. And the amount of iodine you're looking for in them is 150 micrograms a day. How, how does that compare to the RDA that, you know, next to uh, all these micronutrients um, right there on the label, it'll give you the percentage of the recommended daily allowance. How, that 150 micrograms, what is that? And is that so that would be 100%? It would be 100% if you're not pregnant. It's less than that. In pregnancy, uh, the RDA is 220 micrograms a day. And in breastfeeding, it's actually up to 290 micrograms a day. So you're going to need more than 100% if you're if you're pregnant or you're right. And the assumption is that people will be getting some in diet as well as from supplements. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. And then there are some other medications um, that I had read that could be uh, an issue with um, drug drug interactions. Uh, if you have too much iodine at one time, like ACE inhibitors and potassium sparing uh, diuretics, which are used to treat high blood pressure, uh, antithyroid medications. So you, you do want to talk to your doctor if you're on other medicines to make sure that too high of iodine might not be an issue with the other medicines you're taking. Am I right about that or off base? Probably not a huge issue, to be honest. The the one group I probably would be careful about would be um, people taking antithyroid drugs, usually for hyperthyroidism, uh, often for Graves' disease. There, they could get in trouble from excess iodine, although the levels of iodine in you know prenatal supplement are not typically enough to treat 
trigger worsened hyperthyroidism in that group. Yeah. So really, um, the the benefit of extra iodine in the diet is going to far outweigh any risk for the vast majority of, of Correct. folks. Yeah. Um, so then, how common is iodine deficiency? We've we've kind of said you know it's common. Uh, can you put some numbers on uh, on just how common that this this problem is? Well, a hundred years ago, this would have been incredibly common in most of the uh, the globe, and certainly in the United States. Uh, a, a century ago, the whole upper portion of the United States, uh, including especially the area around the Great Lakes and in the Pacific Northwest, was known as the goiter belt, goiter being thyroid enlargement. So uh, a part of the country where you know ch- school children had visible thyroid enlargement, up to 70% of school-age kids had, had enlarged thyroids for, because of inadequate iodine intake. So a very prevalent and very visible public health problem 100 years ago. What changed um, was that in the 1920s, we started introducing salt iodization as a way to prevent uh, that goiter, and that effectively eliminated our U.S. goiter belt by about the 1940s. So Around the globe in the last 30 years, there's been a huge push to try and eliminate iodine deficiency disorders by salt iodization. So we've gone from, you know, 30 years ago, the majority of countries around the world really having low iodine intakes uh, to currently, I believe, only 21 countries that are believed to be iodine deficient overall. But that's not quite the whole story because when you're looking at whole country iodine status, it's obscuring the fact that there may be regions of countries where things are still low or particularly vulnerable populations. And because the pregnant women and the lactating women need more iodine than the rest of us, in a lot of the world, even where iodine nutrition overall has been optimized, the pregnant women still remain mildly to moderately iodine deficient. And we worry then about effects on child brain development. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to uh, go back to something you had said on um, the 1920s is when uh, salt iodization really took off. And it was really meant as a public health um, effort to prevent iodine deficiency so that uh, we don't see uh, intellectual disabilities in kids and problems with child brain development, uh, particularly for um, for pregnant moms and, and uh, moms that are breastfeeding. And I would just say that uh, it seems like we ought to study this really well of what worked because I feel like today, if there was an effort to add iodine to salt, that we would have all of the naysayers on social media saying, you know, this is a conspiracy theory and iodine's going to kill you and cause cancer. And um, it just seems like this is an example of a public health measure of adding, uh, you know, an element to salt uh, that actually worked. It worked beautifully. <laughs> it's it's sort of an undersung, underknown public health triumph. Although I will say it's not quite as straightforward as it might think. And we still have only voluntary salt iodization in the U.S. because efforts to try and mandate it in the 1940s failed. Yeah, just like fluoride yep. in the water yep. and you know, COVID vaccines and and all the other things. Okay, but we will we will not digress into those that territory. Um, so we've kind of mentioned that um, that pregnant women and lactating moms, because they have a higher need of iodine, that they are definitely at risk for a relative iodine deficiency. Um, who else is at risk uh, for for this problem? Probably it depends on where you live. So um, this varies a lot with geography. And so thinking globally, if you're in a part of the world that does not have salt iodization and that historically has low iodine in the soil, you're going to be at risk. So it's basically about where you live. And then if you're living in a part of the world that does have sources of iodine, are you getting adequate ones in the diet? So in the US, we've already touched on the groups that are are known to be iodine deficient. It's women who are pregnant um, primarily, but probably also people with very restricted diet. There's some evidence in the US and elsewhere, for example, that people who follow a vegan diet are at risk for iodine deficiency, mostly probably because they're not getting dairy. Great. So really important to um, really, I think, ask your medical provider, because if you're in an area that is at higher risk for iodine deficiency, hopefully your uh, medical provider knows this um, since they're you know taking care of that that population. Uh, so that may be a good person to ask, hey, how's the iodine? you know is this an issue for our area? correct? Yes, although I have to say in the US, as a country, we're considered iodine sufficient and providers may not really know this. 
a great resource for this is actually the website of something called the, the Iodine Global Network or IGN, uh, which works with the World Health Organization to create global maps that are updated annually that show what countries have adequate iodine and, and where I, people might be at risk for iodine intakes that are low. Great. And we'll put a link to that. Uh, we'll put the link to that site in the show notes over at pediacast.org. Uh, for this episode, which is 524, so folks can uh, find that resource uh, easily. We'll have some other resources and links, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so then we talked about the consequences of iodine deficiency, um, and you know, in particular, if it's severe hypothyroidism, but uh, even when there's sort of mild deficiency, we can see uh, neurocognitive defects if young babies during development are ex- exposed to an iodine-deficient diet. Uh, and then does that, I, I would suspect if you have intellectual disabilities and neurocognitive defects that um, that can result in lower IQ, which then really can perpetuate poverty cycles and make it more difficult for folks to be successful in terms of um, academic work and then careers and all of these things can really be tied into iodine deficiency. Am I overstating the problem? Not at all. It has huge impacts on whole regions, economies, uh, and society at large. It's not just sort of an individual health outcome that, that gets affected. It really highlights the importance for the physician or the medical provider to look at the the person or the family and what's, you know, if we're in the United States and we're iodine sufficient, but it's a vegan family or it's a food insecure family, it's really about looking at those components that make somebody higher risk that I think would help us to focus and target that population to prevent this. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. So it's, and the higher risk is not only where you live, but also what you eat. And so if you are a person um, who is avoiding dairy products or you are a vegan, um, you don't have much fish in your diet, uh, then you are also going to be at risk. And again, would want to talk to your medical provider about that. Um, I I also want to mention since you might not have hypothyroid symptoms to know that you're iodine deficient. How, how do you diagnose this? Like how would an individual um, mom who, you know, maybe in early pregnancy, how does she know if she's iodine deficient? And this is where things get a little bit tricky. You can't, there's not an individual biomarker for iodine nutrition that we can use urine iodine concentrations at the population level, just looking at median amounts to assess populations as a whole. That's why we know, for example, that pregnant women in the U.S. as a group are are not getting adequate iodine nutrition. But urine iodine concentrations fluctuate hour to hour, day to day, and it's been estimated that you'd need 10 or 12 spot or ideally 24-hour urine collections to measure iodine to understand somebody's ongoing intakes with even 20% precision. So it's effectively, it's not completely impractical. We, so we don't have any marker for a patient to go into her provider and you know get tested and know if she's iodine deficient or not. So really, it's about all the clues um, that we've been discussing. You know, what part of the world is this? Are there recommendations for iodine supplementation in specific groups in that part of the world? Um, and are, is there anything about this particular patient's or this or their family's diet that might put them at higher risk? Yeah. So you know. Um... This is a really great point. And I think a lot of people would think, oh, I can just go in and get my blood drawn and see what my iodine level is. But it doesn't work that way. Sadly, no. W- w- why is that? Uh, again, because... <laughs> like you can check a sodium level. Yeah, but not most iodine. of the iodine in our bodies is in the thyroid gland. It's not necessarily circulating in the blood. And um, so yeah. we really can't get a good sense of iodine stores or whole body iodine uh, or, or chronic intakes because it just fluctuates so much in the blood or in the urine at any given moment. So that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> it really does. So in other words, you, you, when you take iodine in, it gets concentrated in the thyroid because that's where it's going to get used. And so unless you took a thyroid sample, which, you know, is not a good idea, uh, then you're not really going to have the, the level of iodine in the blood is not really going to tell you how much is in the thyroid, which is what the important thing. Exactly right. Okay. And so we can combat that by just saying everybody should get more iodine in their diet. Make sure that you're eating dairy foods on a daily basis. And uh, if you're not a fish eater, uh, try cod. Cod is great. And maybe just 
as, as a follow-up to that, that we're really focused on getting the right amount of iodine nutrition, but as for most nutrients, more is not always better. So just because we worry most as a public health issue about risk of, of iodine intakes that are too low, too much is not healthy either and also disrupts thyroid function. So you don't really have any need to ingest um, more than the RDA, and it's recommended against ingesting more than somewhere between 500 and 1,100 micrograms on a daily basis, particularly in pregnancy. Okay. So you can get too much iodine. Yes. You want, you want to be careful about that. Um, so uh, Liz, I want to bring you back in as a primary care pediatrician. Um, just tell us, and we have a lot of, you know, this particular podcast is really geared for uh, parents and families, but we do have a lot of pediatricians and other um, pediatric primary care providers who listen. Um, what what do you see the role of us uh, providers being for helping uh, kids and families and, and pregnant women and lactating women to, to really raise awareness and make sure that folks are getting enough iodine, but not too much iodine? How, how do you handle that in your practice? Well, I think this is where it comes back to just being all about the balance and really trying to support the family and, and keeping it from becoming too complicated. So you have a mom who's maybe pregnant and she's trying to figure out what she should have and she has some other children and what should they have and how much. I don't want to get too much. And um, I think there's a lot of things that Dr. Pierce has mentioned that are just really beautiful about this where a breastfeeding mom, we know that the iodine is concentrated in breast milk and that's probably for a purpose and that serves that young infant. But if the mom is getting some of these foods, eggs, cheese, milk, um, any form of dairy, you know, she's getting her sufficient iodine. And if she's feeding her children the same thing, they probably are too. And so to me, this is really about us being aware, educating families about the importance of it, and then really making it practical um, and not too complicated because otherwise I think people freeze and they don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have come up with uh, something that has been published called the Iodine Action Plan. Uh, tell us about that. Well, it's it's very similar. You know, we've had all these other public health measures that we've done. Everybody knows about folic acid. Nobody questions it. There's no conspiracy theory over folic acid. We know it's important for neural tube development. And so if this is important for brain development, then really this is just about educating and screening. And it's no different than anything else that we do as providers. So to me, this is really after the education, then ask the question. So is this a family that has a special dietary need? Is there food insecurity? We should be asking those questions anyway. Um, you know, is it an access issue? Is it a cost issue? What is the issue for the family so we can support them? Um, maybe it's an education issue or they are fearful about something and then it would be about linking them with a dietitian to really spend the time with the family about what makes sense for them, what they can feel comfortable with. Um, you know, just ask about the foods that they eat. If you hear that they're giving their child milk three times a day or they're incorporating some of these things into the diet, then, you know, we can educate around it, but maybe be a little bit less concerned um, checking those prenatal vitamins. So until this all came out, I didn't realize that prescription prenatal vitamins didn't always have iodine. Um, so asking where they're getting them and, and checking and making sure they're getting the right thing. So to me, this is about the same things that we do in every other area of medicine. It's just ask the questions, educate on the why, and then support them in the how. Yeah, yeah, that, that totally makes sense. I'm asking about salt intake as well and what kind of salt do they use at home and you know how much. And there's an opportunity to talk about whether it's enough salt and also the problems of too much salt too. Right. I mean, especially for pregnant women, we don't, you know, we know there's concerns of high blood pressure and preeclampsia. And this is not about adding salt into the diet where it wasn't already existing. It would be if you're using it, what kind are you using? And then educating around that family and that need and, and whatever that looks like at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Marina, from a dietitian standpoint, what sort of advice do you have for uh, your young patients and the families that you counsel uh, in terms of um, sort of screening for iodine deficiency and the recommendations that you have to prevent that from occurring? So I always say that we don't eat nutrients. We eat food, right? And so I think when we kind of 
stop thinking about nutrient, nutrient, nutrients, but rather focus on food, on the concept of, you know, family meals and real life, right? So I think a lot of the times as providers and practitioners, right, we're really excited about the theory and the importance and, you know, all the science, but then it comes to real life and it's a mom who's working, who's busy, who has other kids, uh, who has to, you know, deal with a lot of other issues. How do we make it feasible? to this mom. Uh, and I'll echo a lot of, of what Dr. Liz said. It's about listening. It's about, you know, educating them. Are they, like you said, are they not eating fish because of the mercury? Are they not consuming dairy because of the lactose and they were consuming some other type of dairy when in fact they could just consume a lactose free? Um, and a lot of it comes down to really, you know, focusing on those nutrient dense foods that we either way will want. So we know that dairy, we know that eggs and seafood are really, really critical for brain development. And so they're going to work in conjunction. Again, it's not just about one single nutrient, but it's about meals. And so a lot of the times what I see is moms and families, we just want ideas. Like, give me ideas. Tell me what this means in real life. And so it's sometimes just comes down to, okay, tell me what you're having for breakfast. How can we change your breakfast and say, okay, let's do it the night before. Let's do a little meal prep. Let's do some overnight oats with some Greek yogurt because the Greek yogurt will also have the calcium, the vitamin D that you're also going to want. And guess what? Some of the prebiotics that your, you know, your gut will definitely want. And so thinking about snacks, right? So pregnant women are very into snacks and, and snacks as a way to optimize nutrition. And so it's asking, right? It's what type of salt do you use? Uh, and sometimes I do this with like every day, every, every one of my friends. And I'm surprised at the amount of non-iodized salt that I'm seeing more and more. Um, if you are vegetarian, if you are vegan, okay, tell me more. Um, and, and maybe we need to start using some type of supplement. So it's focusing on iron, iodine rich foods. It's focusing on getting the right supplement. And if you are using some type of salt, uh, making sure it is iodized. So again, support, uh, is huge for moms. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you had to give one generic piece of advice that would, that would really, um, help improve iodine intake in the whole population, what, what would your advice be? I mean, eggs, fish, and 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 dairy. <laughs> I mean, and and not just because of the iodine, if you really think about it, but it's because of the other key nutrients that they will also provide: the omega threes, the choline, the vitamin D. So it, it, again, it's so hard to just say just eat one food because it's never one food. It's rather one meal, one habit, and so it really comes down to like those three main food groups, the dairy, the eggs, and then the fish are, are key for brain, for brain function, cognitive health, and, and, and they provide other benefits beyond just the iodine. Yeah. Uh, three servings a day, is it, it, would that be adequate of those things? Three servings of dairy a day, you're perfect. And again, it could be anywhere from you know a string cheese, it could be a Greek yogurt or a kefir for breakfast that you're having in a milk, uh, in a smoothie. It could be a little bit of um, cheese that you put on some pasta. Uh, so it's it's simple ways of, of doing it. It's some enchiladas that you're doing a little bit of fish, a, a little bit of queso fresco. And so there are multiple ways and also very unique and culturally relevant ways of also incorporating dairy uh, into our population, into, into pregnant, pregnant women. Great. So milk, cheese, yogurt, eggs, fish, and cod is like the super iodine <laughs> fish, right? Yes. Cod is, cod is up on the list. But again, it does okay. it need to be cod if that is not your preference. I'm not going to force a pregnant woman to consume cod if they're especially nauseous, uh, but they can, <laughs> they can consume other things. Maybe a smoothie would work even better for them. Maybe some overnight oats with a little bit of, of Greek yogurt or a frozen popsicle. So again, that's where, you know, meeting with a registered dietitian. And I'm glad you're, you're both saying it because louder for the people in the back. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. We, when you said popsicle, you mean like a frozen yogurt? Exactly. A frozen There's still got to be dairy in the popsicle. Exactly. No. But it's great for nausea, okay. right? It's, it's, you know, it's still providing that key nutrition. Maybe add a little chia seeds, some flax seeds, some extra omega-3s. You know, we're, we're boosting it up in very simple ways. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Liz, I know that you um, have a particular passion for looking at this um, iodine deficiency really as a public health concern. Um, t- tell us why we should all you know, I, I, obviously I'm not ever going to be a pregnant woman, um, or, or nursing. Uh, so why is that important for, for me just as a, as a citizen, uh, to, to think about iodine deficiency in the community? I look at this and I say that building healthy and productive communities begins within the first thousand days. And that is my pediatrician heart. It is everything about that preconception period to that second birthday that is really the critical time point. Um, It's not that these things aren't important after that. We know our brain develops throughout life and it has this plasticity that makes us so wonderful. But the time period that is most critical is that first thousand days. So making sure that women that are entering pregnancy um, are sufficient and and well-nourished And then continuing that throughout the lifetime is really going to change the productivity of that community. Um, They're going to have higher IQs. They're going to have less risk in a lot of different social areas. So it is a simple way for us to have a huge impact on multiple socioeconomic classes. Um, It's critical. So when we look at outcomes in all different measures that first thousand days is important and including this one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, it, you know, when we when we think about uh, the community as a whole and the success of a community, um, obviously having as few intellectual disabilities as possible is going to be important. Oh, absolutely. But I think, you know, we look at this as intellectual disability, but really when I look at this, it's brain development. It is reinforcing those patterns uh, over and over that we know are important um, and the right patterns then build and you get more complicated patterns and that person becomes more productive in different ways. And and this is very pediatric, right? When parents come into the office, they're asking, you know, they talk about eating and pooping and what milestones the child is achieving. And this is a way for us to explain the science behind what the parents are seeing and really also empowering them to make sure that they're getting good nutrition. And and like Dr. Pierce and Marina were just saying, it's not just iodine, it's all of the things. So, but iodine is one component that we know has a huge impact and it's something that a lot of people aren't aware of. So put that in the context of all of the other education that we're providing. Um, and that has a huge impact on that child and therefore its family and ultimately its community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, tell us um, how communities can come together then to really combat this problem. I think it's really about awareness, as, as Lid has, has just noted, that, as I said, 100 years ago in America, people knew about this problem. People have forgotten. Um, but it's important still in our country, it's important internationally to really continue to understand how important this is because basically it's an easy, it's an inexpensive thing to do to make sure everybody's getting adequate iodine. And that effectively allows people to live up to their full potential. Yeah. Yeah. So really, really an important thing for all of us to consider, um, not just at the individual and family levels, but at the community level. And that's why we're dedicating an entire episode of PediaCast to uh, iodine uh, and the problem of iodine deficiency and how that relates to uh, brain development and ultimately into uh, intellectual success uh, for individuals, families, and communities. All really, really important. Uh, We are going to have several resources for you in the show notes over at pediacast.org, episode 524, uh, including that uh, regional map where you can look and see uh, what areas of the world are uh, deficient in natural iodine. Uh, We also have one. um, This is a a terrific resource. I know, Liz, you were a part of putting this together uh, called The Importance of Iodine in Prenatal Brain Development, uh, published by the National Dairy Council. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And then the Proceedings of the Nutrition Society, if you're interested in a little more sciencey stuff, uh, the role of iodine in brain development. If you want, want to dig deeper into how iodine is involved in brain development, uh, you can check that out. And there's another article in Food Science and Nutrition uh, called Iodine Consumption and Cognitive Performance. Again, I uh, just want to reassure folks that all of the things that we're talking about is evidence-based. And if you'd like to see some of that evidence, uh, check out the show notes over at pediacast.org, and we will have links to the that evidence for you. So once again, uh, Marina Shapiro with uh, Nutra Chicos and uh, a registered pediatric dietitian. Also, Dr. Elizabeth Pierce, endocrinologist at 
at Boston University School of Medicine, and Dr. Liz Zamuda, Director of Medical Education at Doctors Hospital with the Ohio Health System. Uh, thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. This was a real pleasure. Thank you. are back with just enough time to say thanks once again to all of you for taking time out of your day and making PediaCast a part of it. Really do appreciate that. Also, thanks again to our guests this week, uh, Marina Shapiro, registered pediatric dietitian, Dr. Elizabeth Pierce, endocrinologist at Boston University School of Medicine, and Dr. Liz Zamuda, director of medical education at Doctors Hospital uh, with the Ohio Health System here in Central Ohio. Um, you know, after we got done recording, we had our usual sort of post recording conversation. And uh, Dr. Liz actually brought up a really good point that I wanted to share with all of you. And that is, um, as you're introducing new foods to your baby, and we're a lot less strict about that than we used to be. You know, it used to be, um, you'd wait till about four to six months of age, and then you'd start the cereals and then uh, vegetables and then fruits and then finally meats. And, you know, we worried about food allergies of all sorts. And really the, the change of thought has been that uh, now, uh, you know, around closer maybe to six months, you know, breast milk is best if you can up to about six months of age. And then it's kind of more of a free for all, really, in, in terms of just introducing things. You want to make sure that that's nothing that they can choke on, but you really can introduce a lot of different foods. Uh, between six months and 12 months of age. Again, you don't want stuff they can choke on, but uh, as long as it's you know smooth and soft and easy for babies to swallow, um, it's all it's all fair game. And, um, and the exception to that, of course, is if you have a child with severe eczema or there's peanut allergy history in the family uh, or they have a lot of wheezing, a lot of allergic type disorders, then uh, there are some rules for introduction of peanut product, which you can talk to your medical provider about. Uh, but the point is the food that we've been talking about in this podcast in terms of being rich in iodine, uh, things like uh, milk and cheese and yogurt and eggs and, of course, uh, fish as well. Uh, these are things that you could introduce early and should introduce early and really make it a part of their regular diet. So then you don't have to worry about iodine deficiency as much. And the eating habits that begin in infancy really do uh, continue on into childhood and into the teenage years and into adulthood. So by uh, really focusing in on a well-balanced diet, which includes dairy products and fish and uh, these because these things contain uh, adequate amounts of iodine starting that in infancy and then into childhood really sets them up even into adulthood uh, to to hopefully not have to deal with the impact of iodine deficiency so really important to start good eating habits uh, right out of the gate and we were just uh, you know, talking about that, uh, us pediatricians and dietitian amongst ourselves uh, after the recording. And I wanted to share that with you. Uh, don't forget, you can find PediaCast wherever podcasts are found. We're in the Apple and Google podcast apps, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, Amazon Music, and most other podcast apps for iOS and Android. Our landing site is PediaCast.org. You will find our entire archive of past programs there, along with our show notes, our terms of use agreement, and that handy contact page if you would like to suggest a future topic for the program. Reviews are also helpful wherever you get your podcasts. We always appreciate when you share your thoughts about the show. And we love connecting with you on social media. You'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Simply search for PediaCast. I also want to remind you about our sibling podcast, PediaCast CME. That stands for Continuing Medical Education. It's similar to this program. We do turn the science up a couple notches and offer free continuing medical education credit for those who listen. And that includes doctors, of course, but also nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurses, pharmacists, psychologists, social workers, and even dentists. And since Nationwide Children's is jointly accredited by many professional organizations, it's likely we offer the exact credits you need to fulfill your state's continuing medical education requirements. Of course, you want to be sure the content of those episodes match your scope of practice. Shows and details are available at the landing site for that program, pediacastcme.org. You can also listen wherever podcasts are found. Simply search for Pediacast CME. Thanks again for stopping by. And until next time, this is Dr. Mike saying stay safe, stay healthy, and stay involved with your kids. So long, everybody. This 
This program is a production of Nationwide Children's. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on PediaCast.